uh, open and active. Uh, so please continue communicating with us. Please continue to check our website. It's always updated. Uh, we have an updated uh, list of uh, frequently asked questions and those FAQs uh, have a lot of the answers uh, from the emails that have come in and other questions that we are receiving. The focus for tonight will be mainly our remote learning plan. We've gotten tons of questions about how that remote learning plan is going to work across the district, elementary, up through the high school. Uh, and so that will be the main focus. But before we get to that, there are a few updates I want to give uh, from last week's session uh, and over the last week. So one is about our school start date. So we have uh, made the decision to move forward uh, in changing the start date for students. So in a typical year, we have four professional development days. Those are staff only days where we train, require training and other things happen. Uh, so those are usually two before the start of the school year, one in November and one in March. So given the situation that we are in, and many districts are also doing this, uh, we're going to front load those four professional development days uh, to the week after Labor Day. So we'll have Labor Day, we'll have our four professional development days. Again, that'll give our faculty and staff and administration a chance to do all the requir required trainings, but also a chance to uh, get ready for uh, what's going to be a new uh, but exciting uh, school year. Uh, and then the students will be starting on Monday, uh, September 14th. So um, the board will vote on the new calendar next Wednesday, and then we will put it on the website and get it out to our staff. Uh, but uh, you know, all are in agreement at this point that that change will make. Uh, the other update, uh, or a, another update, is I talked last week about the district purchasing gator masks for every student and staff member. Uh, and um, there was a Duke study, a study from Duke University, and a few articles written uh, after that study uh, and saying that the gator masks uh, may not be the most effective way. In fact, um, depending on uh, how you're reading that study, actually, uh, could be that they're less effective than having no mask on at all. So we certainly aren't going to make decisions that are uh, going to put our students and staff at risk. Um, so even though it's one study at this point, we are changing course uh, and we will still purchase, but we're going to purchase uh, masks uh, similar to what we gave out at graduation this year, uh, cloth masks, uh, three ply cloth it is uh, with the Troy logo. So uh, thank you to those who sent me that article. Uh, and uh, again, we will be changing course uh, away from the gators uh, and to the cloth mask style. Uh, transportation update. I mentioned last time that we were in discussions with CDTA about transporting the high school students. I think I may not have been clear enough during that discussion. Uh, there were some high school parents who were concerned that that was the only option and they live in a neighborhood or an area of Troy uh, where CDTA doesn't run and they were talking about having two or three transfers just to get to school. So um, we are still uh, working with CDTA and CDTA is going to uh, help alleviate some of our transportation issues. But um, rest assured, if CDTA does not go in your neighborhood or near your neighborhood, uh, there will be still transportation for those students. We'll have a Durham option. Uh, but with the CDTA helping us, and none of it's really been finalized, but it looks like it's gonna work out for some neighborhoods. But CDTA helping us, it will really help us uh, being able to uh, um, commit to the social distancing that's gonna be required on those buses. Uh, the secondary groupings. So there's a lot of questions about how, how those are gonna be grouped and it'll be again, 50% one day or two days in a row and then 50% the next two days. Uh, those are still being decided, but I think people should rest assured that we're going to be flexible with those groupings. So if we have a grouping set, but there are relatives or you know, family members uh, that aren't in the same group that need to be, or uh, you know, even neighbors that are driving or doing aftercare for a student uh, and need to be on the same uh, schedule, uh, we certainly will listen to all those requests. So uh, when those second group, secondary groupings are decided, uh, just rest assured that we will be flexible for people that need it. Um, and then the last update is regarding ventilation. You know, we've had a lot of questions about ventilation. Um, 
is addressed in the New York State guidance. Uh, please keep in mind that the primary tools to reduce the spread are still social distancing and the wearing of the masks, washing hands and using hand sanitizers, sanitizers. but we certainly do understand the questions and concerns regarding ventilations, especially uh, in two of our buildings, uh, two of our older buildings, School 16 and 18, which predominantly are the ones that the questions are coming from. So for buildings with mechanical HVAC, which is all of our buildings except for 16 and 18, New York State is recommending operating that ventilation all year long, which is our plan, which is what we will do. There are many older school buildings in New York State that rely on natural ventilation. So for those buildings, New York State has recommended windows and doors stay open. So for us, again, that's school 16 and school 18. Teachers will crack the windows, even in the winter, uh, and we will provide fans to help circulate that fresh air once the windows are cracked. In rooms without windows and no mechanical ventilation, uh, which are mainly offices, but there are some spaces throughout the district that have that situation, we'll either move out of that space or we're gonna provide standalone air filters to help circulate the air um, if we do have to use that space. We have purchased the HEPA air purifiers for these rooms. They're medical grade air purifiers and they change the air in a 1600 square foot room once an hour and 1600 square foot is uh, bigger than you know all of these spaces that I'm referring to. So uh, the air will be changed by these uh, once an hour, which is great, great news. Uh, long term, the solutions for 16 and 18 is our $56 million capital project. Thank you to the voters for passing that last year. That project, among uh, including a bunch of other things, will upgrade uh, the HVA systems uh, to mechanical ventilation in both 16 and 18. So those are our updates from last Thursday. Uh, and those were things that we were getting a lot of questions on. But again, most of our questions over the last week have been about our remote plan. Uh, so uh, tonight we'll, we'll spend most of our time talking about that. It'll be in presentation form, but it will, in that presentation, we'll answer the questions that have come in regarding the remote plan. Please remember that this still is depending on the numbers. Remember the form is due ne uh, tomorrow where each parent has to choose. Uh, the in-person at the elementary or remote only or the hybrid at the secondary or remote only and we have about 2,500 or so in already so thank you very much to the families that have filled that out. Uh, some families have said they're waiting for tonight's presentation so that's fine. Please fill it out by tomorrow. Once we have those numbers and we're still in that mid 30 range, 30%, about 36, 37% that are choosing remote only. That's gonna make life easier for certainly for those here uh, in terms of social distancing. Uh, but it'll also, um, we guarantee and assure, and you'll see after the presentation tonight, we have a, a plan for a high quality education for whichever option you're choosing. Uh, and then also keep in mind the remote plan means remote only, so this is not the hybrid plan. The hybrid plan is two on and two virtual, and the virtual term is different than the remote term, which we'll be using tonight. So this is uh, the plan for those families that are choosing all remote to never come in person. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Watson, who will do the majority of the presentation tonight. I'll sit here. Thank you very much. Um, it's my great pleasure to be speaking about the remote only learning plan this evening. Uh, before I get started, I did wanna say a word of thanks to all who contributed to the development of this plan. Um, Erin Shevers, our director of technology and her team have been instrumental in helping to put together this plan. It wouldn't be possible without them. I'd also like to thank all of the school leaders, the building principals, the directors, the coordinators, the curriculum leaders and the teachers who all uh, contributed also to the development of this plan. It really was a true collaborative effort. And I know I speak for Mr. Carmelo and myself when I say thank you so much. We appreciate everyone's hard work. Um, I'd also like to echo um, what Mr. Carmelo said, that tonight's plan presents the most up-to-date information as we know it. Um, but again, it would be subject to change based on numbers and um, any other information that might be coming that we don't know about, but we feel pretty confident um, in the plan as it is. And I also wanted to mention that the plan is in response to the um, questions from the parents in the community. So we looked at all the questions and then we grouped them. And so the flow of tonight's 
presentation, we'll really be looking at um, some aspects of remote learning, and then we'll look at the elementary level, what the curriculum, instruction, and assessment will look like. We'll look at the grading, and then we'll move to the secondary. We'll look at their curriculum, instruction, assessment, and grading, and then we'll finish up with a few slides about special education, English language learners, communication, and some supports that we have put in place um, to assist families with this transition. So with that being said, we'll go to the first slide. Uh, the process to select remote learning. Again, families of elementary students have been asked to choose either in-person learning or remote learning only uh, by August 14th, which is tomorrow. Families of secondary students have been asked to choose either the hybrid model, which is that combination of in-person and virtual learning or a remote only learning model um, also by August 14th. Um, I've included a link um, to the form that you need to fill out. Um, that form and um, a copy of this entire presentation um, are posted on the district website. They've also been translated into Arabic and Spanish. Um, and we do have translators available to assist any families who may need something translated into a different language. Once a family has opted for remote only learning, they will be required to follow that model through the end of December. So it is gonna be important that folks make a really informed decision. And the purpose of tonight's session is really to give you as much information about what remote only learning will look like for your students so that you can make a really informed um, choice. So the first question um, that seemed to be paramount in the questions that we fielded um, from families and the community um, really revolved around who will be teaching these remote only um, students. And so remote learning classes will be delivered by a Troy City School District teacher who will be certified by New York State in the subject area or grade level in which they're teaching. So you can rest assured that we will have our Troy teachers who are fully certified delivering um, instruction to the remote learning students. And that's not true for every district. Uh, I meet with the uh, regional superintendents pretty regularly and many of them are using Questar BOCES or other BOCES or sharing teachers amongst districts. So uh, that's one of the good things in our plan for sure. Our remote learning program is designed to run as a standalone. So in most cases, it will not be connected to in-person learning in any way. So if I have a third grade student who is in remote learning, my child will be grouped with other third grade students who have also opted for remote learning. So it really will be a standalone in most cases. Yeah, there are a few exceptions to that. And again, uh, we'll probably say throughout this presentation, it will depend on how those numbers turn out after tomorrow's deadline. Um, but just uh, talking today, we had a meeting today about this. Uh, if you're in a class at the high school, uh, one of our AP classes or college class, uh, and only two, one or two or three students have chosen remote that are in that class, rather than have a whole section uh, just for those two or three students, or worse, telling them they can't take uh, one of the college classes that they want to or one of the electives they want to, we will uh, virtually uh, connect them to the actual class. So there will be exceptions, but for the most part, it'll be a standalone program. Uh, and then finally, it's going to be important for families to know that students participating in remote learning who decide to return to in-person learning in January may not retain the same teacher. Um, it, that, again, is going to depend on the numbers. It's going to depend on if everybody's coming back. Um, but it's important for you to understand that you may not and likely may not uh, retain the same teacher if you're making a change mid-year. So um, I included a slide that had some characteristics of remote learning. Um, one of the um, responses that we got said some of the language is confusing. And so I just wanted to put a slide out there that um, describes some of the characteristics and define them for you. Remote learning students will receive a combination of virtual educational opportunities and continuity of instruction. So virtual, virtual educational opportunities are are um, resources that we'll be using virtually that will give students a chance to practice um, skills they've already mastered. So they might be 
um, doing a virtual web quest, they might be answering some questions, they might be creating a video, um, a variety of things that will allow them to practice the learning they've already mastered and demonstrate those skills. Continuity of instruction is really new learning. That's online learning designed and delivered by certified teachers that will allow students to move forward in course content and skills. So that is learning that will be advancing students through their coursework. Instruction will be both synchronous and asynchronous. And synchronous instruction is instruction that occurs in real time. So if you are an eighth grader in remote learning and you're logging in, um, to your English class, your English teacher is delivering that instruction in a, in a live fashion in real time. Asynchronous instruction occurs when it's convenient for students. Um, they control the time and the pace. Um, and so this would be opportunities where teachers have pre-recorded um, some content or have um, developed a project for students to work on, and they don't necessarily need to be logged on at the same exact time that the teacher and the other students are logged on. So um, you'll see a combination of synchronous and asynchronous for remote learning students. Blocks of time will be flexible and will allow for live teaching daily and time for students' independent practice of skills. And I think it's important for people to understand that instruction will be synchronous every single day. Teachers will be teaching live every single day. We were really conscious of um, the amount of time that the remote learning students would be sitting in front of a device. And so you'll see we've tried to block it out and break it up where we can, but switching between synchronous and asynchronous also gives students a chance to have some live time with the teacher and then have a chance to do the work, engage in the work at a time that's more convenient for students. We also heard from a lot of families that they would like to um, do some work with students or they would like to supervise those learning opportunities after work. And so could some of the work be done, you know, after four o'clock and this type of format would allow for some of that. So students would be expected to be logged in live um, for some of the instruction and then some of it could be completed at a later time. So now let's break it out by level. So when we look at the elementary curriculum, we really tried to put together um, an educational experience that was comparable to students coming in person. Students will be receiving a full schedule of courses as required by the New York State Education Department, and it will include a 60 minute reading block every day that includes the areas that you see on the slide there, mini lessons, shared reading, um, phonics for the K to two students and word study for the students in grades three to five. A read aloud that is done outside of the reading block, which takes about 15 minutes. And that's really where teachers are really teaching those comprehension skills, whole group. Um, a 45 minute writing block, a 60 minute mathematics block. Science and social studies will rotate every other day for 40 minutes. We included a short intervention and enrichment block of 15 minutes. And then special areas, we are really excited that we're going to be able to provide art, music, PE, and library, minimally one 30-minute class weekly. And some of that will look a little bit different virtually, but um, we've met with the curriculum leaders for those areas, and they have planned really, really exciting, engaging um, learning opportunities for students in the special areas. So we're really excited about that. The delivery model at the elementary level will be Seesaw. Seesaw is a learning management system. It's the primary system that we use during um, our school closure in the spring. It allows for interactive um, learning between students and the teacher. The um, instruction will be delivered using Google Classroom and Google Meet will be um, the only tool that we're using for synchronous learning. So when teachers are doing you know, a whole group and they have their kids logging on, they'll be using Google Meet for that. And the reason we stuck with Google um, Classroom, Google Meet and Seesaw is because students are familiar with these learning management systems and this and these, um, you know, delivery models. They've been using them not just during the school closure, but um, in their regular classes. So the transition will be smooth. They're also Ed Law 2D compliant, which is um, something that we have to pay close attention to um, to make sure that we're protecting students' um, data privacy rights. 
And um, they're also high quality. We found that teachers were able um, during the times that we've used these to really engage students in high quality instruction. We also have planned opportunities for students to interact with teachers and other members of their class using their district email, dis district issued email addresses, um, discussion boards where teachers and students can participate with each other in real time or Google Meet for groups and meetings with individual students. So you can really do a lot in the Google Meet um, format. In addition to those things, teachers may use a host of supplemental tools to enhance their instruction. And again, elementary students are using Dreambox, which is um, a program that they use for math, Reading Eggs, which helps them with their reading skills. And again, these are tools that students are familiar with, and they've been using them um, on a regular basis in our classrooms all over the district. So that's pretty much the elementary instructional delivery model. Um, and if you have any questions, um, I thought about doing a demonstration for a lot of these things, but for the sake of time, uh, we've included links at the end of the presentation where if you click on them, you can have a full demonstration of Seesaw, you can have a full demonstration of Google Meet, and uh, as well as a variety of the other tools that we're using. Uh, this is a sample elementary schedule um, this happens to be grade two, so you can see that there is, um, uh, you know, the, the grade two blocks would be here. Um, so it would start with, we're, we're wanting every elementary class to begin with a synchronous morning meeting every day. So that is when everybody logs on and you're beginning um, bright and early at 830 with your teacher live daily um, to talk about the day and connect to the previous day. And then you can see there how we've blocked out um, the different requirements for grade two. So we would start with the read aloud, moving into the reading block where students would have their phonics work, their mini lesson, their guided reading groups, transitioning to a math block, and then breaking for lunch and recess um, around 11. So that gives students about two and a half hours in the morning and then a nice hour long break from instruction and then they come back for another two hours and 10 minutes roughly with writing, science or social studies, an intervention period and a special. And then we are planning a period at the end of the day that we're calling an access period. And this would be a time where we could deliver any kind of counseling, social emotional supports as per student need. Um, so all students may not participate in that access period, but it is built into the day. Um, it's also worth noting that other services, which we'll get to at the end of the presentation, um, may be provided either during lunch or recess, during the access period, the intervention block, or pushing into regular classes. So if a student receives occupational therapy, let's say for writing, trouble with writing, that may happen um, pushing into the writing block. So um, we will get to the special education slides in a bit. The next slide is about assessment and Mr. Carmelo and I, we met for a, a, a good while about this because um, even though assessment is not everybody's favorite thing to do in the world, um, we feel like this year more than ever, it's going to be really important for us to assess where our students are, um, you know, the break that students have had in school um, certainly um, can affect our students in a negative way. And so we're going to need to assess all of our students, whether you're brick and mortar, whether you are um, remote only. Uh, we need to, to, to really allow all students to participate fully in the district's assessment program. And if you click on that link that I've embedded in the presentation, it will bring you to the calendar of assessments that we do. But um, what's important to know is that we're going to be screening students very early on to gauge their academic needs. We're going to be progress monitoring students to make sure that they are responding to instruction and making gains. And then we'll be measuring their outcomes um, compared to grade level benchmarks throughout the year. And there's a list there of a lot of the different tools. Um, there's a tool there called Sabres, which is also a screening tool, but, but that one is more for social emotional health, which is another area of great concern. And we'll be paying a lot of attention to that, um, not just at the beginning of the year, um, although we will be you know, speaking to that and, and preparing our teachers to um, 
teach the social emotional skills and check in on everyone's social emotional health. Um, but we will be monitoring that throughout the year as well. It's a big, big area um, for us. And so assessment, it's always important, but um, to really make sure that students who are learning in a remote only setting are responding to that instruction and making gains, it's going to be essential, critical um, that we keep close tabs. And the assessments that are on that district calendar are just the big ones. Teachers will also be doing running records and unit tests and, you know, exit tickets and a variety of other um, ongoing formative assessment as well. And then the last two slides for elementary. Uh, the first one is about grading. At the elementary level, um, student learning will be rated using the following system. And you can see it broken out there on the slide. Um, and it's important to note, we're actually going back to um, the way that we did grading um, prior to the school closure in the spring for ELA, um, math, science, and social studies. Students will receive a standards-based grade as outlined below. So one would be not meeting New York State and district standards and expectations up to four exceeding. Um, we've decided uh, to make a change at the elementary level with regard to physical education, art, and music. Um, because we are going to be delivering those um, flexibly and things might look a little different um, and how we assess that, we decided that students will receive a grade of pass-fail for those um, special areas at the elementary level only. And then finally, some other items. I, I grouped these on one slide, um, but there were a lot of questions from families and community members about um, small group work, recess, and supplies. And so they don't necessarily go together, but I put them on the other item slide um, so I could make sure to speak to them. Small group instruction, students will absolutely be participating in both individual and small group instruction. It will be managed within the learning management system and uh, any required related services like speech or occupational therapy or physical therapy, those will be delivered from certified therapists using a teletherapy model, which basically means the therapy will be delivered online um, in that kind of a setting. Recess, uh, we will be encouraging students to participate in virtual activities as a remote learning group, as well as some individual recess activities in the home setting. So again, we're going to need to get creative here. Um, we put recess with lunch and made it an hour so it breaks up the day. So we don't have our little, um, our youngest students sitting, you know, in front of devices for an extended period of time. Um, so it's going to be important for them to have a healthy lunch and to get up and to move. So um, we'll be creative about recess and certainly you'll hear more of that as, as we get closer. And then finally, um, our um, communication specialist, Erin Clary, um, was asking about school supplies. I think she got a lot of questions on the district page about school supplies because the school supply lists have been posted for in-person learning. Um, for the remote learning students, they will be able to complete all assignments using the Chromebook that will be provided by the school district. So um, they really don't need you know, um, physical notebooks or binders or things like that because their work will need to be submitted virtually. Um, so almost every assignment, I would say all assignments, could be completed using the Chromebook. And then the district will be providing some supplemental um, materials like um, classroom, you know, library books for independent reading or small group reading, whiteboards, you know, dry erase boards so that every student, um, you know, when they're in the virtual setting, they can hold their answer up as a way um, for the teacher to do kind of a quick assessment of things. And there will be other laminated um, graphic organizers and things that the district will be providing to those students if families are comfortable um, receiving those things. So that's really it when it comes to elementary. Mr. Carmelo, I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that? I don't think so. Great job. Okay. Uh, you know, again, I said at the beginning, um, quality education for whatever option you choose. I think um, you know, Dr. Watson and her team and all the people that she said were part of that uh, did a great job putting something together for the families that uh, are choosing remote. And I, and I think it, it's a great plan. Okay, uh, so we'll switch to the secondary level. So the secondary curriculum, um, you know, basically 
once you hit middle and high school, um, it's not like third grade where every student schedule is the same. Um, so, uh, but what I can tell you is that the remote only learning students schedules will look the same as the students who are learning um, in a brick and mortar um, situation in Troy. So the standard schedule for students in grades six through 12, whether they're learning in person or remotely, will minimally include the following. And it's gonna be English language arts, mathematics, social studies and science, and then other grade specific courses like CTE, um, career and technical education courses like technology, um, health, foreign language. And again, we're excited that we're able to offer art, music, um, physical education and library uh, again at this level. The district will also still be offering advanced placement courses and university and the high school courses. So I think that's important for families to understand as well. The secondary instructional delivery model will look a little bit different than that at the elementary level. Um, they will be using Google Classroom as the primary platform uh, with the use of other learning management systems like Apex to enhance instruction as appropriate. So um, the second bullet really speaks to the um, Google Meet, again, as the only tool for synchronous learning. Um, and again, we're using Google Classroom and Google Meet because those are the platforms um, and methods that students are comfortable with. They have been using them in all of their classes and um, throughout the closure in the spring, um, but even prior to that. So we feel like that will be a really easy transition for students and it will allow for a high quality um, instructional delivery. Apex is not new to Troy. We, it, it is a web-based tool um, that offers a blended learning model and we're feeling like it can be a very helpful tool to the teachers teaching remote only students. Um, it has been used in the district for credit recovery. It has been used in the district for summer school. It has been used um, in certain um, tech labs in, in our different schools. And uh, it's basically an online um, resource where students can uh, practice standards-based um, you know, activities, assignments, um, content. They, um, it, we wouldn't be using it as a standalone. We would be using it as a tool that will be added to a teacher's repertoire um, of what they can use. So it might be use, useful, um, certainly for that asynchronous learning that we talked about before, where students can participate um, in some web-based learning outside of the live instruction time. Instruction at the secondary level may also include the use of pre-recorded video using Screencastify. Teachers can make recordings of themselves using Google Meet. Um, we are not required, we're not allowed to record students, but we can record faculty um, and um, share those out. And then any other options as approved by the technology department um, to make sure that students have the benefit of learning from a content expert. And so we have a pretty strong technology department and they're not only wanting to help teachers get things approved, they're gonna make sure that they're safe and they're also gonna suggest to us um, other resources and tools that we might not have thought of. So they're, they're really progressive and really helpful. And then finally, the curriculum leaders are working on um, the best ways to address classes that are more hands-on in nature. So these might be classes um, that include a required lab, things that are specific to a certain discipline. Um, but I will say, even during the time in the spring when we were closed, um, students were still participating in labs that had dissections. That's not my favorite thing, but, um, you know, so there are ways to make sure that we are providing students with the opportunity to complete those required labs and to be fully prepared for any Regents exam um, that they would be studying for. So we're confident that we can deliver um, that remotely as well. There's a sample of a um, secondary schedule, a 10th grader, just a, a sample schedule. And I think what's important here is to see that it runs with the same schedule as the high school. And so the day really is going to um, mirror that, which will, um, I think, be helpful um, if, if students do make a change in January. Um, you know, it's not like they're on all different times and things like that. 
Um, but you can just see here, health, geometry, there's a study hall, which will say free period um, for students who are learning remotely. Global history, lunch obviously is on your own, um, would be another free period for students. This student would be taking Spanish, living environment, PE and science lab would rotate and would end the day with English. And again, any supports, whether it's English language learner um, supports that are needed, students with disability, you know, special education supports that are needed, those would be delivered during study hall time or as push-in services. Um, and again, it's going to be, um, you know, important for families to work directly with the service providers to ensure the best situation there. I would repeat what we said uh, a little while ago too on that sample schedule. Um, for the most part, those classes will be all remote students together with the teacher, uh, but there will be exceptions. And again, I mentioned before, our college and the high school classes, our AP classes, some electives uh, that students might want, our P-TECH program. Uh, so if there's only one or two in any of those classes or programs that are choosing remote, then that period that's on there would be actually in with real time with the class that's going on in the high school with students in the room. So it could be a combination, but for the most part, a 10th grade schedule that we're showing in front of you, uh, that would be all remote students. So shifting to the secondary level assessments, again, I'll say it again, assessing our students, especially coming off this break in instruction. Um, I know that instruction was provided, but um, you know, some students were not logging on as often as others. And so it's going to be really important for us to get in and, um, you know, assess students using screeners, figure out where they are, not just academically, but social and emotionally, what those needs are so that we can respond um, with the appropriate curriculum. And there's a link in the presentation, which will be on the website. If you click the link, it will take you to the um, full battery of assessments at the secondary level. It does not include, um, you know, it, those. these are just sort of the district standardized assessments. So at the high school level, know that teachers are giving unit exams and they're giving exit tickets, informative assessments and midterms, and um, some of them give quarterly exams. So those types of tests wouldn't be showing up. Um, these are more the district level standardized assessments. Um, so students would be receiving all of those. The grading system at the secondary level is reverting back to what it was before the spring closure. So demonstration of student learning will be rated using the following system on a quarterly basis. So grade six students will uh, receive, they receive, grade six is a little bit different, which is why it's on its own slide. It's a little bit of a hybrid grading system at grade six. So students do get a final grade a percentage from zero to 100, which you would think of as sort of a traditional grading system. But in addition, they also receive standards-based feedback from teachers in the core areas using the one, two, three, four um, scale with one not meeting New York State st and district standards and expectations up to four exceeding. Um, so they actually get both. In physical education, art and music, students receive an overall grade that is a percentage out of 100. Um, and grading policies, so how much does, you know, homework count and all of that um, are presented in the individual course syllabi. Moving on up at seventh and eighth grade, students receive an overall grade that is a percentage out of 100. And again, grading policies are outlined in each course syllabi. And in grades nine through 12, um, the Troy High School specific courses, students receive an overall grade that is a percentage out of 100. Um, again, see that um, syllabus to figure out how those grades are calculated in each individual course. And grading for the university and the high school courses will follow the guidance provided by the respective institution of higher education. So they tweak some things in the spring. Um, I haven't heard uh, what their plan is for the year. So we're assuming that it's going to revert back to um, the way we've always done the grading, but we'll stay tuned. And if any thing become certain or any changes come forward, we will certainly share them with families um, as soon as we learn them. And then getting to the end here, um, we have two slides um, that speak to remote learning for students with disabilities that Donna Fitzgerald, our Director of Pupil Personnel Services, 
um, worked on with me. Um, I wanted to also point out that um, these are just a couple of quick bullets, um, but Ms. Fitzgerald will be also, um, she has been responding to uh, questions that they've been getting daily, hundreds of questions actually, and um, they're great. So thank you for those and keep them coming. Um, what Ms. Fitzgerald and her assistant have done is to um, collect those questions and organize them and they will be posting a video, um, a, a, a forum, like a video type um, sharing of answers to the most frequently asked questions. I know that the office is also available um, if anybody wants to call them, uh, but they've been working really hard to be as responsive as possible and are excited to put that video out with some answers to the commonly asked questions. Um, so in terms of um, students with disabilities who are choosing remote learning, they can expect to the greatest extent possible to be provided with the special education and related services that are listed in their IEP. Um, under FAPE, the free and appropriate public education um, may be provided consistent with the need to protect the health and safety of students and those providing services to them. So during this emergency, schools may not be able to provide all of the services in the exact same manner that they are typically provided, um, but we are going to do our best to deliver them um, the best that we can. And again, I think the most important thing that I would say is please reach out. So families should work closely with their special education teachers and therapists and really communicate frequently regarding students' progress toward IEP goals in the remote learning model. As I mentioned before in the assessment slide, I talked about it's gonna be important to progress monitor students to make sure that they are learning, they are responding um, to instruction. And the same is gonna be true of anyone with an IEP to really track those IEP goals carefully to make sure that students are making progress and achieving those goals. Um, students will engage with special education teachers using Google Meet sessions weekly. Uh, this is something that um, Ms. Fitzgerald is setting up um, with her faculty uh, and the students um, to, to have that weekly check-in. And also related services of speech, OT, PT, and counseling will be provided in small group or individual sessions, but the length and frequency of the sessions may differ depending on the remote learning schedule. So if something on the IEP says, you know, three times 60, but that particular class isn't happening for 60 minutes, it might necessitate a change, um, you know, to accommodate the day. But again, all of this information, um, I, I would say any questions, you know, we're gonna have conversations about it and make sure that we're meeting the students' needs the best we can. And then finally, um, remote learning for English language learners. Um, Jamie Bowen, who is our curriculum leader for English language learners, has been working tirelessly this summer um, to make sure that everything is in place for English language learner families who are opting for remote only instruction. Um, she's working with her teachers already um, to modify um, the already modified uh, curriculum for this year to make sure that it includes small group instruction, led by the English as new language teachers, targeting specific language acquisition skills and needs um, that English language learner students will receive appropriate instructional supports in English and their home language as appropriate to, to make sure that they can access the curriculum. Um, they will also receive the required accommodations and minutes of ENL instruction pursuant to the commissioner's regulation part 154. And some of those regs require some co-teaching or minutes of instruction. And again, um, we will make sure we do the best we can to, to make all of those services happen. And then, although this isn't directly related to students, I think it's important to know that the ENL department is providing ongoing professional development opportunities um, for remote teaching staff of English language learner students, making sure that it's not just your ability to manage the technology and teach whole class, but that you're also pulling in those strategies for reaching and successfully teaching English language learners, which um, is a sizable um, and important um, group of students in our schools. And then uh, lastly, uh, communication. As I mentioned at the assessment slide that this year assessment is going to be more important than ever. I will echo that for communication. 
Um, and it doesn't say communication between home and school because um, students will be learning in a remote learning um, format. So it does say communication between home and remote learning, whoever those um, remote learning providers are. So remote learning teachers, we will be asking them to establish a working method of communication that works best for every family that is choosing remote learning. So some families may prefer an email, some may prefer a phone call, some may prefer um, having a Google Meet, a, a virtual meeting with teachers and providers. Um, and I also wanted to note that the district translator is available to assist with the translation of any documents or any methods of communication. So they can be part of the phone call, they can be part of the Google Meet. We have um, really extensive support uh, in the translation department. So please take full advantage of that. Remote learning teachers at the elementary level will be available in real time daily for at least one 30 minute period via Google Meet. Again, to ensure the ongoing reciprocal communication between teachers and families. So at the elementary level, um, it's likely that you will have one main remote learning teacher. So if you're the third grade teacher, you're not gonna be teaching art and music and physical education, but you will be teaching the other subjects. And so we're expecting that that teacher will have a 30 minute period daily when he or she is available to families in real time. And again, that may not work for every family. Some families may be working and may not be able to do that. Um, we could certainly, again, work to identify the method of communication that works best for families. And then at the secondary level, uh, because it is not the same teacher for most of the day, it would be different teachers based on area of certification. Um, the remote learning teachers will be available by email and phone call or Google Meet by appointment. And again, that's pretty much how it works right now um, in the in-person setting. But the bottom line is we need reciprocal communication this year more than ever. So we need um, teachers and leaders to be reaching out to families and we encourage and want families to be reaching out to us. And um, you know, we really are in this together. And that brings me to my last slide. Um, which will uh, list a few supports for you. If, if you need additional resources or have questions or need support, your first line would be to contact your child's teacher once you know your child's teacher um, with any issues, questions, or concerns related to remote learning. And I would say to families, do not hesitate, do not feel funny, do not think, well, maybe it'll get better. Um, the sooner we connect, the better. And we have to really make sure that this is working for all of our students and our families who are choosing it. So communication is paramount. Um, and uh, also, Ms. Shevers has included um, a Troy Tech uh, email where you can actually, if you're having technical problems, you can send an email to that and um, someone will reach out to provide technical support to you. The other links I mentioned earlier in the presentation, if you're wanting to know what Seesaw looks like, if you wanna have a demonstration of that or Google Classroom, we have a variety of resources here. And this is a live document, uh, so we will continue to add to it um, as we progress um, and hopefully continue to improve it as we go along and provide even more specificity. And then as always, uh, I just realized I should have started with the mission which is yeah. to provide a strong um, educational and social foundation to graduate all students college and career ready. Um, so I'll slip it in now. <laughs> uh, but you know, we are here to make sure that all of our students, regardless of which method uh, you are choosing for your instruction for the first half of this year, that you will be provided with a strong educational and social foundation. And the goal is to progress you along the way um, so that you too can graduate college and career ready. And it's been a difficult time, a challenging time, but it's always great to end our presentation um, with our slide that says we can, we will, end of story, because um, we know that we've got the right people. Um, we know that our kids are up for the challenge and we know that we're here to make sure that everybody has the best experience possible. So great job. Thank you. It. Thank you so much. And so I said last time that we can, we will. The, the most important part of that this year is the we part. And so uh, I know Dr. Watson stressed it, but I, I want to repeat that stress that communication is going to be more important than ever. And that has to happen both ways. Uh, we need to hear from you. Um, 
when things are going wrong or right so that we can make sure we're fixing it not only for your son or daughter but for everybody uh, and we we promise to keep that communication line uh, open and active from school both during this planning process and once uh, school begins uh, through the teachers and, and building leaders uh, and, and all of us. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, part of that communication and transparency I talked about, this PowerPoint is already on our website. The, rec the presentation site was recorded, so that will be on there again probably tomorrow. Uh, we'll have another one of these forums next Thursday. Uh, we have a board meeting Wednesday, which will, I'm sure reopening will be discussed at that in some senses as well. Uh, and so we will try uh, to make sure we're keeping you informed as things change. I said last week, uh, this is a fluid process and this plan uh, can and will change. Uh, and so as things change or update or we get more details, we will certainly let everybody know. So keep checking our website, keep checking our uh, FAQs. Uh, and uh, keep asking those questions. So thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you, everyone.